Chapter Seventeen, Part Seven, of a Volume Two, of a Popular History of France from the Earliest Times. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Volume Two of a Popular History of France from the Earliest Times by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter Seventeen, The Crusades, Their Decline and End, Part Seven. An unexpected event occurred, and brought about all at once a change in his position and his plans. At the commencement of the year twelve fifty three, at Sidon, the ramparts of which he was engaged in repairing, he heard that his mother, Queen Blanche, had died at Paris on the twenty seventh of November, twelve fifty two. He made so great mourning thereat, says Joinville, that for two days no speech could be gotten of him. After that he sent a chamberman to, for to fetch me. When I carned before him in his chamber where he was alone, so soon as he got sight of me, he stretched forth his arms and said to me, O Seneschal, I have lost my mother. It was a great loss both for the son and for the king imperious, exacting, jealous, and often disagreeable in private life, and in the bosom of her family, Blanche was, nevertheless, according to all contemporary authority, even the least favorable to her, the most discreet woman of her time, with a mind singularly quick and penetrating, and with a man's heart to live in her woman's sex and ideas. Personally magnanimous, of indomitable energy, sovereign mistress in all the affairs of her age, guardian and protectress of France, worthy of comparison with Semiramis, the most eminent of her sex. From the time of Louis' departure and the crusade, as well as during his minority, she had given him constant proofs of a devotion, as intelligent as it was impassioned, as useful as it was masterful. All letters from France demanded the speedy return of the king, the Christians of Syria were themselves of the same opinion. The king, they said, had done for us here all he could do. He will serve us far better by sending us strong reinforcements from France. Louis embarked at St. Jean d'Acre on the 24th of April, 1254, carrying away with him on thirteen vessels, large and small, Queen Margaret, his children, his personal retinue, and his own more immediate men at arms, and leaving the Christians of Syria, for their protection in his name, a hundred knights under the orders of Geoffrey de Sargines, that comrade of his, in whose bravery and pious fealty he had the most entire confidence. After two months and a half at sea, the king and his fleet arrived, on the 8th of July, 1254, off the port of Hoyeries, which at that time belonged to the empire, and not to the France. For two days Louis refused to land at this point, for his heart was set upon not putting his foot upon land again, save on the soil of his own kingdom, at Oegis Mortes, whence he had, six years before, set out. At least he yielded to the entreaties of the queen, and those who were about him, landed at Hyres, passed slowly through France, and made his solemn entry into Paris, on the 7th of September, 1254. The Burgesses and all those who were in the city were there to meet him, clad and bedecked in all their best, according to their condition. If the other towns had received him with great joy, Paris evinced even more than any other. For several days, there were bonfires, dances, and other public rejoicings, which ended sooner than the people wished, for the king, who was pained to see the expense, the dances, and the vanities indulged in, went off to the wood of Vicennes to put a stop to them. So soon as he had resumed the government of his kingdom, after six years' absence and adventures, heroic indeed, but all in vain, for the cause of Christendom, those of his counsellors and servants who lived most closely with him, and knew him best, were struck, at the same time, 
with what he had remained and what he had become during this long and cruel trial. When the king had happily returned to France, how piously he bare himself towards God, how justly towards his subjects, how compassionately towards the afflicted, and how humbly in his own respect, and with what zeal he laboured to make progress, according to his power, in every virtue, all this can be attested by persons who carefully watched his manner of life, and who knew the spotlessness of his conscience. It is the opinion of the most clear-sighted and the wisest that in proportion as gold is more precious than silver, so the manner of living and acting which the king brought back from his pilgrimage in the Holy Land was holy and new, and superior to his former behavior, albeit in him, even in his youth he had ever been good and guileless, and worthy of high esteem. These are the words written about St. Louis by his confessor Geoffrey de Boileau, a chronicle, curt and simple even to dryness, but at the same time well informed. An attempt will be made presently to give a fair idea of the character of St. Louis' government during the last fifteen years of his reign, and of the place he wills in the history of the kingship and of politics in France. But just now it is only with the part he played in the Crusades, and with what became of them in his hands, that we have to occupy our attention. For seven years after his return to France, from 1254 to 1261, Louis seemed to think no more about them, and there is nothing to show that he spoke of them even to his most intimate confidence. But in spite of his apparent calmness, he was living, so far as they were concerned, in a continual ferment of imagination and internal fever, ever flattering himself, that some favourable circumstance would call him back to his interrupted work. And he had reason to believe that circumstances were responsive to his wishes. The Christians of Palestine and Syria were a prey to perils and evils, which became more pressing every day. The cross was being humbled at one time before the Tartars of Chinggis Khan, at another before the Mussulmans of Egypt. Pope Urban was calling upon the King of France, and Geoffrey de Sargines, the heroic representative whom Louis had left in St. Jean d'Acre, at the head of a small garrison, was writing to him that ruin was imminent, and speedy succor indispensable to prevent it. In 1261 Louis held, at Paris, a parliament, at which, without any talk of a new crusade, measures were taken which revealed an idea of it. There were decrees for fasts and prayers on behalf of the Christians of the East, and for frequent and earnest military drill. In 1263 the crusade was openly preached. Taxes were levied, even on the clergy, for the purpose of contributing towards it, and princes and barons bound themselves to take part in it. Louis was all approval and encouragement, without declaring his own intention. In 1267 a parliament was convoked at Paris. The king at first conversed discreetly with some of his barons about the new plan of crusade, and then, suddenly, having had the precious relics deposited in the holy chapel, set before the eyes of the assembly, he opened the session by ardently exhorting those present to avenge the insult which had so long been offered to the Saviour in the Holy Land, and to recover the Christian heritage possessed for our sins by the infidels. Next year, on the ninth of February, 1268, at a new Parliament assembled at Paris, the King took an oath to start in the month of May, 1270. Great was the surprise, and the disquietude was even greater than the surprise, the kingdom was enjoying abroad a peace, and at home a tranquillity and prosperity, for a long time past without example. Feudal quarrels were becoming more rare, and terminating more quickly, and the king possessed the confidence and the respect of the whole population. Why compromise such advantages by such an enterprise, so distant, so costly, and so doubtful of success? 
whether from good sense or from displeasure at the burdens imposed upon them, many ecclesiastics showed symptoms of opposition. And Pope Clement the Fourth gave the king nothing but ambiguous and very reserved counsel. When he learned that Louis was taking with him on the crusade three of his sons, aged respectively twenty-two, eighteen, and seventeen, he could not refrain from writing to the Cardinal of St. Cecile. It does not strike us as an act of well-balanced judgment to impose the taking of the cross upon so many of the king's sons, and especially the eldest, and, albeit we have heard reasons to the contrary, either we be much mistaken, or they are utterly devoid of reason. Even the king's personal condition was matter for grave anxiety. His health was very much enfeebled, and several of his most intimate and most far-seeing advisers were openly opposed to his design. He vehemently urged Joinville to take the cross again with him, but Joinville refused downright. I thought, said he, that they all committed a mortal sin to advise him to voyage, because the whole kingdom was in fair peace at home and with all neighbors, and so soon as he departed the state of the kingdom did not but worsen. They also committed a great sin to advise him the voyage in the great state of meekness in which his body was, for he could not bear to go by chariot or to ride. He was so weak that he suffered me to carry him in my arms, from the hotel of the Count of Auxerre, the place where I took leave of him, to the Cordeliers. And nevertheless, weak as he was, had he remained in France, he might have lived yet a while, and wrought much good. All objections, all warnings, all anxieties came to nothing, in the face of Louis' fixed idea and pious passion. He started from Paris on the 16th of March, 1270, a sick man almost already, but with sole content, and probably the only one without misgiving, in the midst of all his comrades. It was once more at Oigis Mortes that he went to embark. All was as yet dark and undecided as to the plan of the expedition. Was Egypt, or Palestine, or Constantinople, or Tunis, to be the first point of attack? Negotiations, touching this subject, had been opened with the Venetians and the Genoese, without arriving at any conclusion or certainty. Steps were taken at haphazard, with full trust in Providence, and utter forgetfulness that Providence does not absolve men from foresight. On arriving at Oigis Mortes, about the middle of May, Louis found nothing organized, nothing in readiness, neither crusaders nor vessels. Everything was done slowly, incompletely, and with the greatest irregularity. At last, on the 2nd of July, 1270, he set sail without any one's knowing, and without the king's telling any one whither they were going. It was only in Sardinia, after four days' halt at Cagliari, that Louis announced to the chiefs of the crusade, assembled aboard his ship, the Mount Joy, that he was making for Tunis, and that their Christian work would commence there. The king of Tunis, as he was then called, Mohammed Mostanser, had for some time been talking of his desire to become a Christian, if he could be efficiently protected against the seditions of his subjects. Louis welcomed with transport the prospect of Mussulman conversions. Ah, he cried, if I could only see myself the gossip and sponsor of so great a godson. But on the 17th of July, when the fleet arrived before Tunis, the admiral, Florent de Varennes, probably without the king's orders, and with that want of reflection, which was conspicuous at each step of the enterprise, immediately took possession of the harbour and of some Tunisian vessels as a prize, and sent word to the king that he had only to support him, and that the disembarkation of the troops might be effected in perfect safety. Thus war was commenced at the very first moment against the Mussulman prince, whom there had been a promise of seeing before long a Christian. At the end of a fortnight, 
after some fights between the Tunisians and the Crusaders, so much political and military blindness produced its natural consequences. The reinforcements promised to Louis by his brother Charles of Anjou, king of Sicily, had not arrived. Provisions were falling short, and the heat of an African summer were working havoc amongst the army, with such rapidity that before long there was no time to bury the dead. But they were cast pell-mell into the ditch which surrounded the camp, and the air was tainted thereby. On the 3rd of August Louis was attacked by the epidemic fever, and obliged to keep his bed in his tent. He asked news of his son John Tristan, Count of Nevers, who had fallen ill before him, and whose recent death, aboard the vessel to which he had been removed, in hopes that the sea air might be beneficial, had been carefully concealed from him. The Count, as well as the Princess Isabel, married to Theobald the Young, King of Navarre, was a favorite child of Louis, who, on hearing of his loss, folded his hands and sought in silence and prayer some assuagement of his grief. His malady grew worse, and having sent for his successor Prince Philip, Philip the Bold, he took from his hour book some instructions which he had written out for him, and with his own hand and in French, and delivered them to him bidding him to observe them scrupulously. He gave likewise to his daughter Isabel, who was weeping at the foot of his bed, and to his son-in-law, the King of Navarre, some writings which had been intended for them, and he further charged Isabel to deliver another to her youngest sister, Agnes, affianced to the Duke of Burgundy. "'Dearest daughter,' said he, "'think well hereon, for many folk have fallen asleep with wild thoughts of sin, and in the morning their place has not known them. Just after he had finished satisfying his paternal solicitude, it was announced to him, on the 24th of August, that envoys from the Emperor Mihail Palaiologus had landed at Cape Carthage, with orders to demand his intervention with his brother Charles, King of Sicily, to deter him from making war, on the but lately re-established Greek Empire. Louis summoned all his strength to receive them in his tent, in the presence of certain of his counsellors, who were uneasy at the fatigue he was imposing upon himself. "'I promise you, if I live,' said he to the envoys, "'to cooperate, so far as I may be able, in what your master demands of me. Meanwhile I exhort you to have patience, and be of good courage.' This was his last political act, and his last concern with the affairs of the world. Henceforth he was occupied only with pious effusions, which had a bearing, at one time, on his hopes for his soul, at another on those Christian interests which had been so dear to him all his life. He kept repeating his customary orisons in a low voice, and he was heard murmuring those broken words. Fair Sir God! Have mercy on this people that biddeth here, and bring them back to their own land. Let them not fall into the hands of their enemies, and let them not be constrained to deny thy name. And at the same time that he thus expressed his sad reflections upon the situation in which he was leaving his army and his people, he cried from time to time, as he raised himself on his bed, Jerusalem, Jerusalem! We will go up to Jerusalem. During the night of the 24th and 25th of August, he ceased to speak, all the time continuing to show that he was in full possession of his senses. He insisted upon receiving extreme unction out of bed, and lying upon a coarse sackcloth covered with cinders, with the cross before him. And on Monday, the 25th of August, 1270, at three p.m. he departed in peace, whilst uttering these last words. Father, after an example of the Divine Master, into thy hands I commend my spirit. End of chapter 17